Kali ni kati uta. Kali sura tukka. Ma patah la kayu matukka. This morning, Pandian and his cousin are inspecting their python traps. Ma kayu matukka lagi. Ula ma kena kali. Ski bayi macam ada lama me kayu tera kena la. Patah satu satu tera kena pun dia patah pergi besar besar dia tera kapla masuk pun sampai tiga inci juga. Ya sampai dia mereka pelak boleh masuk ke atau pula boleh kena. Tara satu satu pun jaring pecah pergi. Tapi boleh dia main kuat punya tu main ah gaduh punya tu pula main jagat punya lah. Every day Pandian and Ganesan roam the jungles of Perak, just north of the capital Kuala Lumpur. They have been professional python hunters for 15 years, tasked with catching the most valuable reptiles for the luxury goods market. Hurra! A few meters away. A monitor lizard has been caught in a trap. But it's little consolation for Pandian. These giant lizards fetch just a quarter of a python's value. Their skin's less desirable and less lucrative. With its diamond patterning and iridescent tincture, the reticulated python is highly coveted in the world of leather goods. For more than 40 years, the rainforests of Southeast Asia have supplied major European fashion houses, including Gucci, Hermes, Prada, and Louis Vuitton. Worth more than $1 billion annually, it's an immensely profitable industry. Until 2004, up to 350,000 Malaysian pythons were killed each year for bags, belts, and shoes. Then, fearing the extinction of this protected species and condemning the permissiveness of the local authorities, the European Union banned the import of Malaysian snakeskins, a severe blow to the world's largest exporter. Ten years on, has Malaysia recovered from the impact of this ban? And where do the big brands get their stock today? After five hours of hunting in the scorching heat, Pandian and his cousin still have nothing. Pythons are becoming increasingly rare. <laughs> A sign of impending extinction or just a twist of fate. With no political will behind the protection of this endangered species, no official record of the population has been kept. After going a whole month without a single python and any source of income, Pandian decided to expand his hunting area. Now, it covers nearly 800 square kilometers of oil palm plantations. Like Pandian, Several thousand Malaysians depend on python hunting for their livelihoods. At long last, Pandian's luck appears to be changing. Oh. A python has been caught in a trap. It's not venomous, but more than capable of suffocating a human. They can grow up to 10 meters in length and weigh in excess of 140 kilos. It's to avoid potentially fatal accidents that Pandian hunts with his cousin. The catch of the day is a female, barely three meters long. It poses no risk to the two men. Tara 
Lepas saya ini tengok hati sikit, tapi... Kamu nggak? Tolok, pura! Their clients demand perfect skins. Even the slightest blemish can lower the price by half. After a long day of hunting, Pandian and his cousin return home with a meager haul. The two hunters are Malaysian Indian, the country's third largest minority. Their Tamil ancestors arrived at the end of the 19th century to work as slaves in the rubber plantations. At the time, the nation's primary resource. Two generations ago, Pandian's family reinvented themselves as python hunters. Tapi India memang ini barang dia suka tangkap tapi uang tidak nampak juga. Kira ada surat gaji satu satu tempat satu tempat ada orang saja itu pasal dia ada suka suka bagi juga. Dia orang suka dia bagi. Tara tara suka kali dia tara tangkap saja lah. In the evening, a local buyer pays a visit to the hunter's community. Mr. Lau travels the region in search of fresh pythons for his exotic skins business. With his expert eye, Mr. Lau quickly notices the scars. Since the ban on exports to the EU, the price of python has fallen dramatically. For his day's labor, Pandian gets just five euros. I know it's not, it's not a good catch, but this is what I can do for them. So I can get this much only. Unless the quality is good, we can pay more for him. Susah sikit lah, pagi sampai pusing, nanti abang mau ikut juga, saya kita mau duit kat situ juga. Uh, kira tu macam mana macam, tengok. Nanti minyak air si, mau kedai sendiri duduk, makan pun tengok mana macam. Pandian has earned only 100 euros in the last few weeks. In a good month, he can make up to 500. Sekolah rupa dia. Pandian and his wife Saraswati have three children. His unstable salary is the sole income for the household. Kita dekat tarapu, kawan dekat minta lah, minta nanti bagi, bagi susu ga, mama makan semua mama beli mari. Tepasal ini hari mau pakai dua hari, tiga hari. Biar pergi, pergi lalu cari-cari ada dapat, baru tuang sedia sana. Tunggu pun, dah kasih tidur lah. Since an accident caused Pandian to lose sight in one eye, Saraswati has feared for her husband's life. Ada takut, saya marah dia. Saya marah berapa kali. Dia cakap, tak boleh, saya tak boleh lepas ni kerja. Saya marah. Kerja membuat ni kerja juga dia cakap. Saya marah beberapa beberapa kali pun saya ada marah. Ada pergi klinik pun ada. Ada jahit empat belas empat belas jahitan. Ni tangan. At 29 and without any formal qualifications, Pandian does not have a choice. Kalau mau kita pun terapi baca sudah bodoh. Karena mau sampai sekolah mau baca bye bye. Nanti dia pun sudah besar dan nanti kawin mau kena mau kereta kak. Jangan kaya lah. Ngamam makan cukup hutang apa pun tak boleh duduk kak. Boleh saja. There are ten companies nationwide involved in the buying and selling of pelts. But of these. Only Mr. Lau's family-run business agreed to open its doors. Once a specimen is bought, Mr. Lau's ten employees then cut and sun-dry the skin. This one, the quality okay. Sometimes we can reach 
40, 40 snakes. It's a good catch, 40, 50 snakes per day. And sometimes even uh, 15, 20. With over 100 hunters supplying him with stock, Mr. Lau is able to export between 8 and 10,000 python skins every year. That's as many as before the ban. But today, the Malaysian authorities require all vendors to hold hunting licenses. The fee is three months. That means the quota is something they control like this, uh, three months. If you hunt, apply 100 snakes, you can, hunt, uh, you can hunting 100 snakes for three months, not more than that. So if the quota is finished earlier, let's say the hunters catch the snakes before three months or 100, so they must renew back every time. At 50 euros for 100 snakes, the hunters themselves cannot afford the license fee. So Mr. Lau covers the cost until business picks up again. Okay. By helping my hunters, uh, annually more than 50,000 ringgit for the license fee. So this is what we can do for them. So uh, because we are not earning much in this now. Unless we can export to Europe, we can get more profit, more margin profit for this. Forbidden from selling directly to European clients, Mr. Lau looks to the Asian market. Singapore, Hong Kong and South Korea. Uh, some customers, they, they want the big size, something like this, see? It's 30, 30 cm up, so I can, I, can, I can expand more, more to 40 cm up. So you can see the size, see, now it's 30 cm, 38. Okay, so now I'll try to get uh, 40 cm. Three to hand, four handbags. Depend what size they want to make. They want small, maybe you can get more. Mr. Lau grapples for every centimeter he can get, because with new Eastern customers, the price per meter has dropped. Now, he's forced to sell his skins at two-thirds their original price. Karnita Krishnasamy works for Traffic, an international NGO campaigning to safeguard this endangered species. She says the export ban has helped prevent the reptiles from dying out. The trade suspension came into place because there was a... It was a huge volume of wild-caught export skins being declared from Malaysia, um, and there wasn't sufficient verification to show that this volume of skins was from legal and sustainable sources. And so they took a precautionary approach um, to essentially, it sends a message back to the Malaysian government that perhaps the current procedures needs to be re-looked at in terms of um, ensuring that the current systems in place provide for a legal and sustainable trade in Malaysia. Under scrutiny from the European Union, Malaysia has lost its place as the global market leader, making way for Indonesia, Singapore and Vietnam. Hello! Descended from a Chinese-Malaysian-Indian marriage, the Lao family made a promising start in business. When the demand for snakeskin first arose in Europe towards the end of the 1970s, it was Mr. Lau's father, the first reptile hunter in the region, who made a name for himself in the export market. My father went to hunting, I follow him. So I know the, the skills. <laughs> Back then, his exploits would make the headlines. Within just a few years, he had made his fortune. At the time, trade was totally unregulated. Mr. Lau Sr. is furious about the ban on exports to Europe. According to him, talk of extinction is preposterous. Oil palms, which now occupy 25% of non-urban land in Malaysia, 
are the best possible habitat for pythons. In 40 years, the Lao family business has killed more than 400,000 pythons for the luxury goods market. Slaughtering methods frequently come in for criticism, often suffocated or skinned alive. Animal rights activists have called the treatment of the reptiles unacceptable. In the Lao slaughterhouse, decapitation is the method of choice. He does not understand the accusations of abuse. If you, if you they think python killing python is cruel, even the, if you eat the chicken also cruel. Body same, body is an animal. The difference is this wild and this profession. Before they are decapitated, the animals are stunned. A practice studies have shown to be the least traumatic method of slaughter. A small advance, considering that other countries like Vietnam still practice suffocation. Having been filled with water, the carcasses are hung out for several hours to make the skins expand. Gilberto is in charge of skinning, a prescribed practice in his native Indonesia. He arrived in Malaysia three years ago to work in the slaughterhouse. Like two million other Indonesian workers, Gilberto left home in search of a better life in Malaysia. For his labors, he earns 320 euros per month, five times less than the cost of a cheap python skin bag. In the boutiques of the West, python skin bags sell for up to 7,000 euros a piece. The European market enjoys more than 95% of the industry's profits. What's left is shared around the manual laborers of Southeast Asia. With a view to increasing their revenue, the Lao family have expanded into other python products. The bladders are collected and dried. Highly sought after in traditional Chinese medicine, they are reputed to cure flu and certain infections. As Mr. Lau sees it, no part of the snake should go to waste. In these freezers is a plentiful supply of meat. Sold at 50 cents a kilo, it's destined for the market stalls of Hong Kong and Vietnam. But in spite of his best efforts, meat and organ sales represent just 5% of the company's profits and skins remain the primary source of income. Today, his son is preparing a shipment of 500 pieces. Ini kulit ular sawah kita sekarang ni uh, prepare untuk ekspor ke Singapura uh, dan kita perlu kumpul lah. Jadi biasa uh, kita setiap uh, dua bulan atau tiga bulan sekali bila dah cukup uh, dia punya kuantiti kita mula ekspor. 
With this shipment, Mr. Lau expects to make 7,500 euros from his buyer in Singapore. But he's under no illusions. Despite the trading ban, these skins will eventually make their way to Europe. Other Asian companies buy, I think they export to Europe. Because what I believe, I don't think Asian people use the Python skin. I think Europe people more, more prefer the, uh, this kind of leathers. People involved in the trade have found different avenues to ensure that the trade continues. So what's happened is they've rerouted the, the trade. Um, so for example, what we've seen is that Singapore is receiving a lot more um, skins. And in, in, at, an, at an international level, Singapore really is the most important player in terms of re-exports of skins into the EU, for example. And the EU is happy to receive skins from Singapore. Figures published by CITES, the international regulator for trade in endangered species, allows us to trace these export routes. They divulge, for example, that in the year 2009, France imported nearly 5,800 skins from Singapore. What's more, their shipping licenses even listed Malaysia as the origin of the goods. They should never have been allowed to enter Europe. Outside the law, Italy, Germany and Spain all did the same. Since then, the number of customs inspections has increased, but buyers have found new ways of sourcing their stock. This exotic skin tannery, the only one in Malaysia, is one of the country's largest exporters. Owned by a Chinese capital group, Sunny International exports 40,000 pre-tanned python skins every year. After three weeks of treatment in these blanching drums, whitened skins will sell at twice the rate of Mr. Lau's raw hides. Mr. Wang, the manager, has found a more direct way to reach his European buyers. Once in Turkey, Mr. Wang's stock can easily make its way into Europe. There are a number of exotic skin companies based in Istanbul. Posing as French designers, we got an interview with an intermediary. How many skins do you have in stock now? Python, since 4,000 skins. So every month I sell 3,000 to 4,000 skins and I keep stock 3,000 to 4,000 skins. Uh, do you have uh, skins from Malaysia also? Yes, but the Malaysia CITES is not good for Europe. You cannot get the skin into Europe with Malaysia CITES. So we need to deliver with Indonesia CITES. I can pass the customs w without any control? Yes, I know which one is Indonesia, which one is Malaysia. But it doesn't matter for you because nobody can say this is Indonesia, this is Malaysia, by looking at the skin. From this exchange, it appears that laundering contraband Malaysian python skins is all too easy. All that's required? A fake sites license listing a false country of origin. OK. And uh, um, do you have uh, other clients from, from France? Of course. When questioned, not a single French luxury goods outlet would comment on the practice. There isn't a traceability system right now, whether at a national level or a regional level or international level. Um, such a system simply does not exist. Um, and it's not to say that we cannot implement a system. In fact, that is essentially what traffic and a number of other parties are also pushing for, in that a traceability system is put into place to ensure that the skin being, the snake being caught by one individual, say from a location in Pera, is the same skin um, being sold in one shop in, in the EU, for example. To ensure better traceability, as well as a sustainable trade, a solution was proposed by the traders themselves, livestock farming. Yeah, atas, atas dulu. OK. 
Okay. Mr. Lau is the first to trial the scheme in Malaysia. The purpose to get a good quality and breeding the snake for future uh, snake skin market. So then, uh, maybe in future we don't have uh, depend on the wild snakes. We can depend on the farm. So uh, it's really good. So this can uh, future also can avoid the extinction of the python. So he has already gathered 500 pythons for his farm. Beneath the shelter of the palm trees, he keeps his most prized possessions: newborns. This baby pythons. I uh, just want to check. Make sure they already shed skin. Uh, the shed skin is ready to feed. I mean, we can feed them. We can different reds and birds. Mr. Lau will have to feed his snakes for four years before they reach adult size. An additional cost for his business. I cannot get the real figure now because I, they not reach adult. But we really want, uh, want the real good price for this. With his farm, Mr. Lau is hopeful that one day the European Union will reopen its doors to Malaysian snakeskins. But will the luxury goods industry be prepared to pay a higher price for a legal and sustainable trade? <laughs>